Okay, well, welcome to the second virtual meetup. I'll keep letting people in as they appear. Um, I imagine probably get a few more because people tend to turn up right up until it finishes last time. So this is number two, um, just drawing your attention. Of course, you can see that. Just drawing your attention to the bit at the bottom of the screen that this workshop will be recorded and posted onto YouTube. So if you're not happy with that, um, please drop out of the meetup. A little or, bit of or you, or, or you could just um, mute yourself and turn your screen off. Uh, mute, mute your mute your sound and and turn off your video, and then you'll be fine. That's true. You could do that. Um, so if you guys can mute yourselves now, I think you all have anyway. Um, so we've talked about the recording. If you've got any questions, please feel free to drop them into the chat. Um, I will pause occasionally to ask questions if anyone's got any questions. Um, and if you need to drop out of the meetup for any reason, you will be able to get back in. Um, I know the meetup time said this one's two hours. It's actually not, it's only one. That was uh, my mistake. Oops. <laughs> so you'll be able to go to bed, Jane. Um, so our program for today, We've got our welcome. We might do a quick run around for the people that didn't introduce themselves last week because there are some new people in here. Um, we're going to talk about camera types. You can see I've got a bunch of them over here. Um, and we're going to talk about using Google Photos. And Max will be helping to present that. Um, so he'll be yes. showing us at uploading and putting them into maps. And I'll be showing off search which could get quite interesting because I haven't pre-staged this. It's my usual Google Photos. And being a photographer of people, you never know what will turn up. We'll take that <laughs> as it goes. Um, and the last thing that we're going to talk about today is whether it's OK to cruise on auto with your photography or whether you should take a bit of control. Let's do lots of people coming in. So go on to the first part, if it'll let me. There we go. So. To start with, we're going to talk about different camera types. And you've probably seen plenty of them. Um, you probably all have one particular type or style that you use the most. Um, a little bit later in this session, that was my Google Nest going off, telling me there's someone outside. There you go. Um, a little bit later in this session, I'll actually launch a poll just to see what kinds of things that people do actually use. But I thought I would start with a little blast from the past. So I'll just hold this up. This is called a, a reporter. Now, I don't open this camera very often because this part of it here is um, cardboard and leatherette. So you can imagine it's a little bit fragile. This is, um, I think, 1940s, this one, or maybe a little bit earlier. It's got a fixed lens on the camera. So not a zoomable one. And I'll explain the difference between those in a moment and show you if my tether works. And we, this is one you've probably never seen, apart from Ananda. He's, I think he's actually used this one. This is a twin lens reflex camera. So you'll hear, you've often heard about single lens reflex or digital single lens reflex. This is the other version. And it's a little bit different. If it's going to let me open it today. There we go. Because you look down inside the, the mirror inside. So there's no mirror in these things. So I guess it's the earliest mirrorless camera, Ananda. <laughs> um, but it does have prisms that help you see where the light is. And we'll move on to the single lens reflex. Now, we're still in film cameras at the moment, which is a bit deliberate. I do want to do them in order. Um, these ones, light comes in through the lens, bounces around in a little prism up here, and you see it in the viewfinder in the back. And it's got a lovely high resolution screen on this one too. Getting into the more modern varieties. This wasn't my first digital camera, but it's the same model as one of my first ones. So I actually threw that camera away a long time ago. And I found this one and thought, great, I'll have that. Um, 
So the I've just got a question about how old the cameras are. So the the Mamiya, that one's probably about 50 years old, I would think, somewhere in that range. The DSLR Mamiya is a, a late 60s, so probably. So the other one might actually be earlier. Um, this one was from 1991, I think, from memory. This is another old one. This is actually my favourite old one. This is a Japanese Futura S. So this style of camera is rangefinder. You probably won't see this in the meeting notes because I did actually forget one style. Um, in these ones, you don't look through the lens. You look through an eyepiece, which there's an eyepiece on the back and where you see out the front. So what you're looking at is very similar to what your lens sees, but not quite the same. And if you're capturing things close to the borders of your image, you have to be pretty careful so you don't lose any. Getting into some of the more modern stuff. So we've got our little point and shoot camera. This is a mirrorless one. It's a Fuji film. I don't know if you can see. There you go. You can sort of see me. <laughs> so it's a little... Fujifilm X10. I actually won this one in a competition, so I was kind of happy. <laughs> You've got a little baby mirrorless camera. This is a little Olympus. Very, very similar to the Fuji, except that you can take the lens off and put different ones on. Um, just out of interest, we'll cover um, pro glass and amateur glass in, in another session. I think it's actually next week. But these two lenses are essentially the same. One of them's amateur league, that one, and one of them's professional. The professional one, a lot better built, quite a different degree of brightness that you can actually get through this one, but still very, very similar. So there's nothing wrong with using this style. This is my current beast and the one I hope to use for some of the demonstration later. You might know it's got a cable hanging out the back of it. Um, I want to tether this to show you the differences in some of the lenses. Um, we'll do mostly on lenses next week, but I will touch on them very briefly in here. Max is uh, probably going to be happy at the moment. Do you want to hold yours up, Max? So you can probably see... Yeah, Max's... so here's the, the Theta... Uh, theta... Z1, that's a 360 camera. It's about a thousand US dollars, and this is great for taking street view photography for Google Maps. Yep. Uh, and if you want to learn more about that, you'll need to stick around for another week where we're going to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> Bit of a plug. Yes, indeed. We will be doing a session session on the 360. So this is its little brother. This is the original theta. And somewhere around here, I've got a Theta V as well. But um, like I said, I don't actually know where that one is right now. I will need to find it. Now, there's one camera that we have. Actually, haven't... Just, just in the comments, just curious, who here has taken a 360 photo, either with their phone or with a camera? Just write in the comments if you have taken a 360 photo. Just uh, Ollie was pointing out this camera takes a floppy disk, and yes, indeed it does. So who's seen a floppy disk? Who's old enough to have actually seen one? It also takes... This was the... I think this might have actually been the first flash memory. This was called the Sony Magic Gate Flash. Um, this one is... You're going to laugh at this. This is 16 megabytes. <laughs> a whole, and it still works amazingly the original flash had an issue that if you wrote to it more than about 10,000 times it died so um, while I do take that camera out in the occasional photo walk I don't use it much because I don't want to kill the flash because I can't replace it now there's one camera that we haven't talked about yet and it's probably the one that most of you have got so you've all got a phone camera 
this is probably the most common thing that contributes to maps, whether you've got Android or iOS or possibly a Windows phone, if you're one of those crazy people. Don't think there's many of those left now that they've killed it again. But um, Or you could get into the new Huawei operating system, but we won't go there because it can't run maps. Um, but most of you have probably got one of these. The main difference between the different cameras is what you can do with them. So they all have one thing in common. They all take photos. They all make images. But they have some very subtle differences. The phones tend to have some really, really clever software. And this software is starting to appear in camera bodies now as well. It's often got um, some machine learning, or a lot of people like to call it artificial intelligence, but I do prefer machine learning because that's what it really is. Um, software that makes your images better. So you may have noticed that there's a significant difference between the lens in a phone and in a camera. Even in a baby camera like this one, there's still a massive difference between the two of them. The phone lenses have come a long way. The phone sensors are very, very small. You should actually be able to see the sensor in there. So that thing that sort of shining a little bit blue and occasionally reflecting people's faces, um, that's the sensor. Well, it's actually a glass filter on top of the sensor, but the sensor's behind it. Uh, the sensor in that is in normal handheld photography standards, actually a fairly small one. It's called a micro four thirds, which means it's about that big. <laughs> I won't go into the specific sizes of all of them because I don't want to get too confusing. But you can imagine that the, the sensor in here, it's only about that big, a tiny little thing. So they have to rely on some smarts to make your pictures better. But you have to admit, if you look at the stuff that the latest phones do, and I don't care what your favorite brand is, they're all pretty good. Um, some of the stuff that they do now through that tiny sensor and that tiny lens is quite amazing. So. The different kinds, when you're carrying them around, uh, might govern what you do. So if I'm going out on a photo walk, I'll generally take the big beast with me because this is versatile for me because it carries a nice zoom lens. It's got a lot of image stabilization, so I can do handheld images in almost complete darkness, which is something that the older DSLRs can't really do. Um, you, people might have seen me talk about in the meetup post that I think the D in DSLR stands for dinosaur. There's two reasons for that. One is that flappy mirror inside. So when you actually take a picture and you're looking through the thing, there's a mirror that sits down and it reflects that image out of the lens up to your eye. When you go to take the picture, the first thing that happens is that mirror slaps up. That exposes the sensor that's behind it. And then you can take a picture. Some of those cameras do have a live view, which means the mirror's up when they're doing that. But most of the time, once that shot finishes, the mirror has to come down again. And all of that moving plastic and glass means that you're susceptible to a bit of shock when you take a photo, and that can lead to more blurry photos. Not having a mirror, like this little beastie in the mirrorless cameras, and it doesn't really matter which mirrorless brand you use, they're all good. And all of the big brands have even brought theirs out now, they've given up. Even Canon and Nikon have given up and brought out mirrorless cameras finally, fairly decent ones. Um, those ones, you don't have so much shock because the only moving thing is the shutter and you can even turn that off. You can have an electronic shutter if you want to, but that has other considerations. Um, but you can also do some really amazing things. The Olympus one that I've got here um, has some really nice in-camera composite capabilities. And it's also got um, the ability to let you see the image as it's developing on the sensor, which is kind of good. So you could probably guess my favorite camera type. So I'm just going to come over here now. I'm just going to copy this. So I'll just drop out of the presentation for a moment because I just want to copy this link into the chat. This is a bit of a, a poll. Just to see what your favorite camera is. Hopefully that turns up now. Um, I'm just going to take a quick run through people's questions while we're doing that. And if you wouldn't mind popping off and just answering that poll, and we'll have a look at it in a tick and just see what people are thinking. Uh, there's lots of people saying hello in the chat. Someone saying it's resembling X-Men. Oh, I guess that was Max's uh, thing. 
Uh, we've got Roberto who was introducing himself. He's from Crispito in Cartagena in Colombia. That's pretty cool. I don't think I've ever met a Colombian before. How are you? My gesture made the chat go away then. That was kind of funny. And we've got Shreya who made the point that um, mobile is always there to capture. And that is very true. Um, one of the, the best words, I think, and I, I'm not going to attribute this to me. I have no idea who first said it. But one of the best things I've heard is the best camera for the job is the one you've got in your hand. And which one do we carry around all the time? You may not have another camera with you. Some people like me are weird. I generally do have a large camera with me, but not always. There's another, I don't know if you've heard this other saying, they're saying the best camera you have is the one that can take 360 degrees. <laughs> they can all do that. <laughs> just, that's just what I've heard. Is the, That's what I've heard. Heard about traps. That's the... <laughs> Uh, Ewage, the link shouldn't take you out if you open it in a new tab. So if you right click on the link and say open in a new tab, it should just take you out to the form. I'm just verifying that and it does for me. So I'm just going to answer the thing now while I'm actually in here. This is more just for curiosity. It's um, Yeah, Google already has all the data about uh, what photos, what cameras take uh, being uploaded to Google Maps. Uh, yeah, they probably do. <laughs> now we've got Falguni joining us now. So I did let a few people in while we were doing that part of the session. So just a reminder that I am recording this and it will be uploaded to YouTube. And as Max points out, if you keep your video off and your sound off, you don't have to worry about being recorded because if you not visible, I can't really record you. So I'm just going to pop over to Drive and just see how that form's going now and just see what people are doing. I've seen a few people clicking away there. It'll be interesting to see what, what this comes up as. So I've got 24 responses here. Let me just drag this over here and I'll stop sharing the slideshow and then I'll present the form. So this is quite an interesting outcome. Have you all had a chance to fill this in? Everybody who wants to anyway? You don't actually have to do it. Is that coming up now? I've got a spinning pinwheel of death here, so I'm suspecting this form's not going to display Oh, uh, looks like we've lost Paul for a little bit. I'm just going to play some on hold music until he comes back. And he wants to join in with the whole music, you can. Might help if I turn my microphone on. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Oh, well. Um, anyway, so we've got 29 responses came in on the form, so it's quite interesting. Uh, nearly everybody is digital. Looks like maybe one person went for film. We've still got people coming in. Uh, favorite camera type looks like phone is probably the main one. We had a few people go for 360, we had four people for 360. We had seven for... Uh, DSLR, DSLR, and four for mirrorless. What's funny, though, is all these people on the phone, they're really mirrorless as well, so, you know, we win. <laughs> and what camera do you use the most? Now, that one's not that surprising to me. I, I didn't think the number would be quite that high, but I, I'm not that surprised that it's the one that most people use the most. I did certainly answer that myself. So that's pretty cool. 
So if we come back to the workshop now, hopefully that's changing back to the workshop screen. Because the next thing we're going to do, and I won't bother bringing that back into presentation mode, because Max, who's just frozen, of course, is about to take over. Hey, Paul, how's this? Hey, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. I'll just stop presenting so that you can uh, start presenting. Awesome. So just while uh, Max is getting set up, he's a, a 360 street view photographer. He's in the Trusted Street View program and takes lots and lots of pictures inside shopping centres and places like that with his 360s. So take it away, Max. Hey, everyone. Um, uh, no hold music right now, but yeah, uh, I wanted to share with you a really awesome tool for um, for using uh, uploading and uploading photos to Google Maps and just storing all your photos in general. Uh, this is Google Photos. It's a free app on your phone and it's free on your desktop as well. It's a free part of your G, your G Google account. Um, and so I went. Uh, today I went out for Mother's Day. I um, mean, all of my photos are automatically uploaded to my Google Photos uh, album. You can see I've, um, we went we went for a walk in Belgrave, um, and uh, this, uh, yesterday uh, I had some fried chicken uh, in uh, yeah, the South in Market in Melbourne. And so I'm going to teach you how to load one of the out photos that on Google Photos. So if we go to Google Maps. Hey, Max, you might want to just turn off your video for a moment because I think you're running out of bandwidth. So leave your presentation up, but kill your video. OK, I'll do that. Nice. Um, so, and you can go to your contribution. Actually, just to tell me if you already use Google Photos. I'm curious, who already uses Google Photos um, in the chat? Let us know. Um, but this is your contributions at the top. Um, and there's a similar version in your um, similar version on your phone in the Google Maps app. You go add photos maps. Uh, yep. In theory, that should work. Oh, here we go. So it's automatically putting, uh, populating some of your um, photos that are in your, that you've uploaded to Google Photos and a suggestion you should put in. Now, the one thing I would say is try and only put one photo of every type. Very similar photos like this, people using Google Maps, and um, you will temporarily get points for it, but they will very quickly be taken away because they're not so useful. Isn't that right, Paul? Okay, well, yeah. yeah. So I'm going to um, scroll yes, down. Yes, you're absolutely right, Max. Pelicana chicken milk. Yeah. Um, so I'm, this, is a, this is one from Pelicana chicken milk that I took yesterday. So I'm going to, that, that is a, a one unique photo. And it's got very yummy. Is that the and place we go went to the photo walk? Next. That is, yeah. I went back there. <laughs> cool. Good memory. Um, and there, that's now uploaded to Google Maps, and you get your five points for it, um, which is pretty awesome. Or um, the other way you can contribute is um, you can actually search directly from for the um, directly for the place that you went to. So for example, today I went to Tree of Delights. I took a nice photo. Uh, I'm just gonna sit. So I'm gonna, that one's gonna come up. I think my wife's watching Netflix at the same time, so <laughs> maybe. <laughs> No, don't worry. There's uh, I'm not gonna three, three other people. people there's three other people playing games and watching YouTube and doing whatever else they're doing in here. So I know the feeling. <laughs> yeah. Um. So this is the listing for Tree of Delights, the, the cafe that we visited today. Um. And you can actually go, you can go and see oh 360 that that that. Uh, yeah. Um. 
I'm just going to share that, show that so we get an idea of what the 360s could, can look like. Yeah. So you did a 360 at the cafe, Max? You broke up a bit. I did a 360 at the cafe. So it sounds like you did do a 360. I think I picked that much up from the uh, robot voice. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm just trying to repeat what you I'm say so other what... people get it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, OK, so there's the 360 there. And it will load. And, and you can see I'm not that pixely in real life. Um, that's my daughter and my wife. They also look much uh, less pixely in real life. The full photos, I don't know why it's just taking a bit of time to load. Yeah, 360s is well, one of the I'm only times you can stuff tend to get away with selfies because they're actually ah. quite hard to escape from, especially in a small cafe. Yeah. Um, but, you know, if you look down, you can see all the food. It's actually a very good representation of what eating a cafe in the cafe looks like. Are they letting you dine in or is it um, just takeaway? Uh, it's just takeaway at the moment. But luckily, there was a, there was a, a there's a, par, a a public bench five metres away from the rest of the cafe. <laughs> um, so just say you've, you've taken a photo a couple of days ago or yet today, you click upload a photo. And if you click to photos from phone, that actually is your Google Photos um, data. The, here's all, the, all your Google Photos stuff is in there. And uh, lo and behold, here is a photo of me and my wife eating, enjoying some food from there. Now, you've got to be careful. You don't want to have too many selfies on Google Maps. Um, you keep, you it's just keep not them really... on your <laughs> Yeah. I'm actually not going to upload that one. It's not really... It's not really worth it. If it's a food shot, that's the best stuff. You want food shots, you want vibe shots. Um, if you upload too many selfies to Google Maps, it just it's not a good experience. But you click select and then it goes up. That's how that's how it goes. Um, yeah, but let me know in the comments if you have uploaded photos using either of these methods. I'd love to know how you upload photos to, to, uh, from Google Photos or from just other ways to Google Maps. Um, let me know in the comments how you do it. Um, Paul, did you want me to go into anything else or you wanted to add anything? Oh, you can give us a very brief intro to 360s if you want to. Maybe pan oh. one around. Um, uh, you know what? I'm going to save that one for when we do it in the other time. <laughs> hey, don't get me started. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be going to in depth. Uh, no problem at all. All right. Well, if you stop presenting, I'll take it back. Okay, I'm stopping presenting now. And I'll just... Uh, actually, I want to present a tab rather than all of Chrome. You know, I'm thinking that somehow the, somehow those quick uh, captions are actually automatically generating in this, in this video. That's really interesting. They are indeed, yes. And Very I'll, high tech. And I have just presented the uh, wrong tab. <laughs> that was silly of me. <laughs> because I actually <laughs> want to present right now, I want to present Google Photos. Now, uh, someone just asked a question in the chat. Yep, so this, uh, it was a way talking about the free versus compressed ones. Um, and Ananda's posted a link into the chat. We might just cover that one. Um, who with Google Photos, and I've just seen the most excited local guide ever. Nya is here. <laughs> I remember the look on your face when you got a phone at Connect. <laughs> um, anyway, the how many of you have got it set to high quality or original quality? So high quality, pop your hand up for the people that have got video turned on. And original quality? I, so, so I, have, I, have, I have original and I bought some, um, I bought some space. Yeah, so the difference is original uses up your drive space and high quality doesn't, but it does change your photos. So it depends what you want to do with your photos. It doesn't change them very much. I've actually got high quality turned on because I take too many photos. So 
I'm presenting my Google Photos at the moment. Hopefully you can see that. Uh, when you say you take too many photos, can you uh, go into that a bit more? Uh, let me give you an example. So in my Lightroom catalog, there are 202,109 photos. And I take uh, 2018, there was 16,000, 2019, 12,000, and 2020. <laughs> 2020, I've been slacking a little bit. I've only got 449. Have you been slacking or have you been isolating at home? I think I've been isolating at home because every other year has been around 20, 20 to 25,000 images per year. Now, they don't all go on maps. Very few of those actually go on maps because that's not what I take them for. But I just wanted to show you um, Google Photos. So I, I'm presenting this one at the moment. And the reason I wanted to show you this is I wanted to show you how good search has gotten because I'm quite frankly amazed with search. Now, I saw someone saying that you can use tags to help you find stuff. You don't really need to anymore because thanks to all of the kind of people at Crowdsurf who are submitting all of their photos, Crowdsource, I should say, all, all the people submitting their photos of donuts and cupcakes and trains and planes and identifying photos. And I can see Jess smiling because I think you were level 13 or a 14 in Crowdsource, something like that. I just reached 14. Yesterday. Yay! Well done. Yay. That That's actually quite impressive. If people think of the local guides levels, um, you know how we stop at level 10? The crowdsource levels keep going and they get harder and harder and harder. And I'm a lowly level 8 in crowdsource. <laughs> but I just wanted to show you how good search was. So let's say a few weeks ago, or maybe a week ago, you went to a cupcake restaurant. You want to upload your cupcake photos to Maps. But if you just scroll through, if you're anything like me, there's too many photos, probably too many of trains, a few too many of planes. But you can just type in cupcake. There they are. <laughs> All the cupcake photos you've ever taken and some people that look like cupcakes who aren't really. So. It's kind of handy. It works quite well. Um, maybe you went to a railway station and you want to find that to put up on maps. That one's taken a little bit longer. It's found a lot of Lego trains. It's found some street art. <laughs> did it find a station? Yes, it did. There's one. There's a steam train station. There's another one. So you can find so, um, things quite easily. You're going to say something, Max? I was going to say that um, there was a generated data class, um, but they did have problems early on in Google Photos because um, they somebody typed in a, a gorilla or orangutan or something um, into yes, it, did. and um, they uh, and they yes, took they, and then they, what came up was pictures of themselves. So and they were they were African American people. So the, the algorithm has is not not fixed that yet. So but now now they've fixed it, but it was a bit embarrassing at the beginning. Um, yes. Yeah, to have those photos. The outcome was a little bit funny. Of course, we've all got photos of our pets, don't we? Let's see how many cat photos there are. Hmm, maybe a few too many. Okay, well that's. All I wanted to show you from search. Does anybody actually have any questions about Google Photos that maybe Max or I could help you with at the moment? There's a good one from in the chat from Sri uh, from Sriya Barai. Uh, question: Google Photos and Google Drive. How do these two different forms used to store and drives also back up from the storage? Question: um, They've actually split. Google Photos and uh, Google uh, Google Drive are now split, right? So they don't interact with each other. Um, so uh, I would recommend using uh, Google Photos to back up all your photo content and just pull up there. It has a lot of advantage. And um, if you have any um, photos in Google Drive, copy them, uh, take them from Google Drive, put them in photos, and then delete them. From that would be my recommendation. Max was breaking up a bit there, but what he's saying is that now Google Photos and Drive are no longer linked. They were originally. Um, it was also the case some years ago that if you added a photo from Photos or from Drive onto Maps, 
and then deleted it from Photos or Drive, it also disappeared off Maps. That's been taken out now too, they're separate now, which is quite good. Um, we've got a question from Mohammed. of will I talk about using Google Photos link on Connect? That's actually harder than it should be. You may have tried. <laughs> I see from your grid that you have. Um, it's actually a horrible experience <laughs> trying to get Google Photos on to Connect um, because Connect, their, the software that they use, um, it's not actually a Google platform, it's a commercial platform. Um, it's called Chorus. Uh, they want a URL that ends in .jpg or .gif for them to actually show the photo in Connect. And Google Photos doesn't give you URLs like that. So if you, let's just take this photo, for example, and we share it and we want to get a, get a link for it. It creates a link that doesn't really look anything like an image URL. So I'll just paste this link into the chat. Um, so those kinds of links, Connect won't actually take them which is kind of annoying. Um, there are some tricks to do it. If you um, have a look at, I'll, I'll, an, I'll answer the question about Pixel in a minute. Um, if you have a look at uh, Connect, it's I'm trying to think who wrote it. I think it was Hermes. So search for Hermes, Hermes T. Um, he's actually got an article for how you can link Google Photos into Connect. It kind of works, kind of does, kind of doesn't. Um, what I would suggest you do is go over to Ideas Exchange because there is an, an open idea on being able to easily add Google Photos into Connect and vote on that idea because it would be fantastic to get that implemented. Uh, Niai has asked a question about pixel free storage of photos until 2022. That's for the, the full quality. It's free till 2022. Um, every Pixel phone, I think, is free, free for three years or four years, something like that, after you get the phone. And if you keep it on the original quality, they do start charging after that for the space. But if you keep it on um, high quality, it compresses the images. And they're still free, and they stay free. Uh, we've got a question from Feliciana. How many gigabyte is the maximum storage in Google Photos? That's an awesome question. Um, we did find out at Connect that the maximum photos in an album is 5,000 because we broke Google Photos at, I think, the second, I think it was the second summit we broke Google Photos because it was kind of new then. Um, but I don't think that there's a gigabyte maximum, not that I know of. I've never heard of anybody running into one. And I'd be surprised if I didn't do it. Um, there's a question from Anshuk, does deleting the photos uploaded on Maps have an impact? Um, it doesn't impact your space. It doesn't really change anything there unless you're storing in original quality and then it does. So if you're uploading to Maps and you're set to original quality in photos, um, even though the two aren't linked anymore, it still uses your space, which is a bit weird. So it makes me think that they're not linked, but maybe they really are behind the scenes. Uh, Max has given some additional information there. I've got someone else coming in. Um, Adrian's got a question. He says he uses Snapseed to edit his mobile photos, but sometimes Snapseed use, loses the EXIF data on the edited photo, and so when uploaded to photos, it has the wrong date and time. Is there a way to batch edit the data? Um, Sadly, I don't think so, unless you know Firebase. If you know Firebase, Google Photos does have an API, so you could call the API and do that, I would imagine. Firebase is Google's scripting language. Uh, Vibav has, or Vibav V actually, so it's the, the female one, as distinct from Vibav, who's not. Um, Interesting I've noticed in photo search features, you can search for specific filters like me in a red shirt or a green bottle. Yeah, you definitely can. So I'm still hearing that. So I might say, I'm just searching for that because it'll be funny if it finds it. Doesn't looks like that didn't work. <laughs> I don't think any of them are me, but no, there there actually is a photo in there of that. 
it was kind of funny that it didn't find it. But yeah, you can do things like that. Um, you can search for things like sunny sky. You can search for things like planes landing, and it knows the difference between planes landing and planes taking off. It's a bit weird. Shoulder just apologized for coming in late. That's okay. Um, it's, I'll just remind you that we are recording this and it will go up onto YouTube. Um, that's probably enough of photos now because we're doing pretty well on time here. Uh, we're just going to progress on to the next slide and I will sh share that in just a moment. Uh, we've got the question, is it possible to use panorama picture on a handset? So I assume you meet a phone for 360 degree street view pictures. Yes, you definitely uh, yeah. can. Oh, no, but not recommended. Uh, you won't get a great photo out of it. They're not, not awful, but yes, a 360 camera is better. But if you haven't got one, um, please Wait, just use sorry, I, want, I, I, just, I just want to clarify, it's, it's, not, um, it's not a panorama. It's actually, you have to take a full 360 photo using the Street View app not just the standard panorama that you could take on an iPhone or other photos. It needs to be a full 360 image. Yep, that's true. Um, it's actually about 128 individual images and you end up looking a bit like a ballerina as you hold your phone up and do all these sweeps. <laughs> and the app directs you how to do that. So if you're really interested in that, we can probably include a demo in a future session if you want to. Uh, maybe we can do it in the 360 one. Yeah, okay. We can do that. Um, now, Hopefully I'm presenting and you can see my screen. And I've got a question up there, is shooting on automatic okay? It's a, a vexing question amongst the photography community. Now, I tend to live in the camp that yes, it is. It is okay if you take a little bit of control. You don't have to take full control of your camera. Some people will call me a heretic for that and they will say that you have to take manual control all the time or you're not a proper photographer. I think the technology since this camera, which is a full manual camera, is so different between that one and this one, why wouldn't you use that technology? You've got a very clever computer in these things that does an awesome job of helping you to take better pictures. The most important part of any photograph is the composition, and we'll go into that in a later session. So I would encourage you to use the technology. I don't live on full auto myself. I live on um, aperture priority usually, which means I'm setting, and we'll talk about this properly in another session, but we're, I'm setting the depth of the image to be what I want. But what I am gonna show you now is a little tip. So I went down to the beach the other day and I also went out to the local airport. I want to show you what taking a little bit of control means and I'm going to use the Google camera app on the phone. This also works in the iPhone camera app. It's slightly different in that one but it's very similar. So in the next screen you're going to see some really short videos and we've got a very late comer. Um, I'm going to see some really short videos. In those videos when I tap on the screen you'll see a little circle appear where I tapped. And what I want you to look at is as these videos play, is what's happening to the image when I'm selecting a place. So each time I tap, I'm selecting the thing that I'm interested in effectively. So we'll just advance off the next screen and just watch this image happen. Hopefully it will play, there we go. So it's telling me to take a panorama, but I don't want to. So I've just tapped on the rocks in the left of the image. You notice how the whole image brightened up? Then tapping on the ocean water, we get much richer colors because the ocean water is white there. Tapping on the cliffs, we get lots of brightness. The sky is starting to burn. And then tapping in the sky, everything else darkens up. So you get quite dark in that foreground in those rocks. We've got another person coming in. So I've got a couple more of those that I'll show you. But in each of those things, what I did when I tapped on the screen is I told the camera app the thing that I was most interested in having properly exposed and in focus. So in the Google camera app, both things happen when you tap. Now, there's another thing that you can see on that image there. Um, across the middle of the screen, you can see a, a white bar with a zero above it. That's a, a very handy level meter. So that tells me that my phone is actually level 
while I'm taking that image because one of the things that um, I try to be careful with and I hope most people realize it there's nothing weirder than looking at an horizon, whether it's in a photo that you want to keep for your family stuff or whether it's a photo you're putting on maps, there's nothing weirder than an horizon like that when it should be flat. So if you've got sea meeting sky, it should be flat. If you've got land meeting sky, it should be flat depending on the terrain. So that cliff's actually not quite flat, even though the level meter says zero, um, because that cliff actually is on a slope, which is okay. So we'll just go on to the next one. So it's the same thing again, but, uh, no, it's, this is the one I want. So now I'm just looking at the, the ocean water and the rocks at my feet, tapping on the rock and it brings that rock into focus and nice and bright. I've tapped on the sea now. So the sea's mostly white. So the phone's reacted by bringing everything else down, but that gives you some much richer colors as well. So when you're exposing for that white in the sea, it's bringing down the other things, which helps with your color reproduction. Go on to the next one, if it'll let me. There we go. So I'm down at the, the local airport near me. It's a tiny airport. So I just looked at the picnic table on the building. Up in the sky, makes the sky a lot more dramatic. And then I think I'll go over to the flags. So you kind of see what happens when you're doing that. If you start doing that with your maps photos, and it doesn't matter if you're outside, or if you're taking food photos, the same thing applies. When you're taking a, a food photo, um, I don't have any food with me in here, but when you're taking a food photo, let's say that this was an item of food and it's sitting on a plate. If you take a normal photo, the phone's gonna guess where to focus. You might be lucky, it might get the food and it might properly expose for the food, but it might not. It might expose for the plate or the table behind it, or the sky behind that, or whatever's happening in the background. So if you direct it, if you push it to do the right thing, you'll get a better outcome. I think there's one more of these. So this one, you'll see some really big changes in some aspects here. So tapping on the tree brings that tree up and brings it out of the shadows. And then into the sky, it really changes the image. So when you go on the sky, you end up with a really dramatic image. So make sure you choose your subject from your composition, the thing that's important to you, and tap on that when you're using your phone. Now, the same thing works with cameras. This particular one, you actually can tap the back of the screen. A lot of cameras do let you do that these days. But the, the DSLRs and things like that tend not to have that feature because they have to send the light through the mirror when they're doing that. Um, on those ones, you need to select a focus point with your camera. I'm not going to go into how to do that on the 10,000 different brands of camera because <laughs> we'd be here forever. So what I'd like you guys to do, and I'll just stop this presentation again so I can get this link. This is your first task from the workshops. I'm just going to paste this link into the chat. So grab the link out of the chat because I won't send it out in the update because I only want the people who are here to actually do this. That's a Google Photos album. At least I hope it is. Let me make sure. <laughs> I think it is. Yep, it is. So that's a, a Google Photos album. And what I want you to do is to take your phone or your camera and I want you to try that technique of exposing properly the thing that you're most interested in in a photo. Now, I don't care what you take a photo of. Um, keep it within the bounds of what would be good for a local guide. So it could be food, it could be a picture of a flower or a cat or whatever, I don't really care. Um, choose that one thing. And what I'd like you to do is during the next 24 hours, and I, I'm hurrying this a little bit because I want to put them in the video. and. At this point in the video, we'll switch off to this album and I'll go through each of the images in the album. So everybody will get to see what you contribute. Um, I will make that video at eight o'clock tomorrow night. So eight o'clock my time, Australian Eastern Standard. So that's about 23 hours from now, really. So if you could get, get that done, if you want to do that, that would be awesome. And we'll all see what focus is what sort of images you're coming up with. Now, I've just got to post one more link into the chat because anybody that's had a meet up with me knows that I absolutely love 
my feedback surveys. <laughs> so that link I've just put in there is a link to a Google form, which is a feedback from this meetup. So it just, um, it doesn't collect who you are. It only collects your feedback itself, whatever you choose to put in there. And, I, I and just wanted... so if we give, if we give bad feedback, does our Google account get deleted? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> no, because I don't actually know who you are. It's an anonymous form. I've left it that way deliberately. Um, if you want me to contact you, there's a, a comment section at the bottom where you can say anything else. So if you want me to contact you about your feedback, you need to give me a way to do that. The best way to do that is give me your connect handle and I'll, I'll private message you there. If you want to give me another way to contact you, that's okay. I can do that, but I prefer to do it through Connect. So has anybody got any questions for what we went through today? Feel free to unmute and ask questions if you've got one. I don't think it's... Uh, hi, Paul. It's Isha here. Hello. Yeah, hi. So I just wanted to know, like, uh, the way you showed, right, uh, we can slant it to a particular degree after using the panorama option. I just want to know that how, how can we come to know, like, exactly, like, for some photos, we, you have, I've seen you have taken zero degree or for some three degree, like, like, uh, what is the best thing for the best type of photo, say, for food, or do you differentiate on the basis of objects? Like, how do you decide that? Yeah, the level meter really only applies to landscape images. So things like what we're looking at there with the photo around the, the cliffs and the sea or um, photos out in the forest or whatever, level's quite important there. Um, the other time it's important is with architecture. So we've got a session on building photography because the maps people do a lot of building photography. Um, there it's important uh, not so much to keep the top of the building straight, but to keep the building itself straight and it'll help you do that. So we'll talk about that when we get into that session See, you, Adrian, we'll we'll talk about that when we get into that particular session because I'll cover that in a bit of detail rather than doing it here. But for food and things like that, the level doesn't matter so much. So generally, if you're taking pictures of a plate of food, it's better to be a bit creative, use the light to your advantage, move around so you've got the best natural light you can get on your food. Um, for those of you who weren't here last week, we did have the little tip for food photography. So you've all got a phone flashlight. Um, if you put a napkin over your flashlight, now it's best to use a friend's phone when you're doing this, but if you use your light directly, I think you can see this, then you get a lot of bright reflection. But if you use a napkin or a doubled up napkin, um, it just helps with the light a little bit and it makes it less harsh. So you don't produce those horrible shadows because there's nothing worse than flash on food photography. It looks really bad. So try and avoid flash where you can. So food photography level's not so important. Um, I often go directly above food photos and look down directly on top of them. I have occasionally been known to stand on a chair just to get a better image. Max has turned into an egg. <laughs> I, I, I would say, especially if you're doing a burger, um, if you get this sort of top-down angle, it looks fantastic. It really makes the burger sound alive, look alive. Yep. Cool. Did that answer your question, Isha? Yes, yes. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Paul. And thank you, Max, I guess, right? Yeah, thank you so much. No, you're welcome. Has anybody else got I'll a try to post a photo today and share with you, Paul, like the way you said. I'll just try to use those tips and let me see. Let me know, like, what you feel about that, okay? Yeah, sure. So anybody else got any more questions? Oh. Paul, Paul, I have a question, please. Can I go on? Hello, Paul. Yes. I have a doubt regarding the task. And we've got uh, two actually, people. Sorry. I didn't actually get what to post. Uh, hello? Yeah, we can hear you, Shreya. Uh, I just wanted to ask you about the task. Do we have to post a particular panorama or only the photo uh, showing different exposures? No, any photo that you want to make. So granted, most of us are locked down at the moment and we can't go out and do lots of things. Um, where I live, yeah. we're, a little, we're a little bit lucky because we actually can go out if we're by ourselves. We can go out yeah. for exercise and things like that. So um, any photo that you want to create, whether it's a, an object like Baby Yoda or okay. a cat or, yeah. or a, some food, whatever you want to do, just use mm. that technique. Yeah. 
Okay. Okay, so we can post only a single photo in that Google link which you sent us right now. You can put in more than one if you want to, but try okay. and pick try try and pick your best one. If you've got a couple that you want to post, that's okay. 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 So yeah. we had another question from and I hope I get your name right. Yep, go. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Please does the brightness of your camera or handset affect the quality of your picture on a sunny day? Yes, it does. So if you can have not enough light and you can have too much light, both cause you problems. And you can also have very harsh light or softer light. So if you're in the middle of the day, it's having lunch, you're at a cafe, you're outside and you're shooting a picture out there, you're going to need to be really careful because that overhead sun, very strong, very harsh, and it makes very hard shadows. So when you're Usually in food photography, you want to be a bit softer. So you want to make the food look inviting. You don't want to make it look harsh. Um, it, it, I guess it's a little bit similar. I do people photography. If you're shooting a female, a female usually likes to be softer. Male likes to be a bit harder because they want to see a, a, a muscle culture or something like that. Um, similar with food. If your light's really, really strong, then your any bright things that are in your food will get washed out. So maybe you've got a, a hamburger sitting on a white plate. That white plate will be so bright, you won't be able to see the plate itself. You'll only be able to see the burger. And your camera will probably get a bit confused trying to balance that extreme brightness of the plate with the food itself. Now, the other end of that is, and we've actually got a session on this coming up in our workshops, and I'll show you some of these things. Um, the... The other, other end of that spectrum is not enough light. Now, you've probably seen grainy photos come from the phone. Grainy is attractive in film. Grainy is not attractive in digital. I don't care how many filters you do, they're not attractive. Um, and it usually happens because your camera or your phone is struggling because it hasn't got enough light. So it boosts its sensitivity of the sensor right up. And when that happens, you get lots of other artificial things coming into your picture a bit like Max, where you get noise. So you might have an area of your image which is black, and instead of black, you'll start to see red and purple and green and things like that. Thank you. I think someone just said a new, um, new I, record for late entry there. We just had someone join us six minutes after we do to stop. <laughs> Paul, can you, um, can you please stop sharing your, uh, your, your screen just so people can see your, your and the questioner's face a bit closer? Um, sure. The other thing I was going to say, I posted a link to Paul's photography um, on Instagram. So if you want to follow Paul, you want to see more more photography examples, you can see some of Paul's there. Um, and I'll also put my own so you can see some of my food photography examples. Yeah, sure. You're all welcome to put your, um, if you use Instagram, pop your links in the chat if you want to. You're all welcome to do that. Um, now, something else I wanted to, to show you, we, we, actually, you won't be able to see that one. It's not strong enough, but we are running out of time. And Max reminded me because he loves his filters. I wanted to show you something because the term filter actually comes from photography. So all these things like Snapchat filters. In photography, they're real. So this one... You won't be able to see any difference in this light. But this one is a circular polarizer. So you may see images where someone's taken a picture of a lake and or a river, and you can see to the bottom of the river. That's because they used one of these. If you don't use that, the reflective light coming off the water surface stops you from seeing in. Um, I'm not sure if you can see. Maybe if I hold up something white behind this. I've got a napkin here. There you go. So the bottom half's clear, top half's dark. When you're shooting at the sky, if you position that transition from light to dark at the horizon, it helps you control your sky on a really bright day, but still have a good exposure in the bottom half of the image. And you, you may remember that thing I talked about, how you can alter the way people look. That's what this one's for. So this one... It's hard to tell when you're looking through a webcam camera, but um, it actually makes it look like you're shooting into the rain. So if you're shooting a person, it looks like they're in the rain. It's kind of cool. <laughs> it's kind of silly, but it's kind of cool.
Um, that's all the topics I had for tonight. I'm just going to have a quick look and see if there's any more questions in here. It uh, doesn't look like I've missed anyone. Um, does anybody have any other questions for tonight? Yeah, me, it's me. Um, yep, go. Yes, when I, uh, when I was uh, taking a picture of a ceiling, okay, there was a square architectural piece in the square ceiling, but uh, the base, the baseline, if I focus on the baseline, uh, the square uh, architecture is uh, uh, a bit slanting. Yep. And if I focus on the square of the uh, ceiling, the baseline is a little bit slanting. Sure. I so, yes. You're, you're getting into architecture questions, and we do have a session on that, but I will explain it. Um, so yep. um, do you know the term 90 degrees? Does that make sense to you? So if you've got, if you've got a wall, or in your case, a ceiling, mm. You want to shoot at 90 degrees, so you want to be directly under it. Yes. Or if it's on a wall, you want to shoot this way, directly towards it, and stay at 90 degrees to the building or the ceiling or whatever it is, because if you and you'll still get some slanting with a phone, it'll always happen because it's just the the, the cheap lenses they use. But um, to keep things the most straight that you possibly can you want to stay as close on. I can actually show you in my webcam. So you can see those bookshelves behind me that are on a bit of a slant. That's because I turned my camera so that you could see the, the cameras themselves that are on my desk. But if I put the camera up where it's supposed to be, do you notice how the bookshelves are fairly straight now? Yes. But if I turn it, so I, all I'm doing is I'm doing this with the, the lens, I'm just turning it to the side. They start to slant. Yeah. And, that, and that's what's happening with those. And same if I start tilting it downwards, apart from you can see more of me, which is not great, but the shelves start to slant. So that's the effect that you're talking about, I think. I'm going to try and get this back in the right spot now. There yes. we go. So, yes. cool. Any other questions? I just wanted to say thank you to everyone who joined in today. And um, we've recorded all the names and everyone here will get a free entry to Connect Live 2021. <laughs> uh, I'm so excited. You're all, you're all coming. It's going to be great. I look forward to seeing you all there. Just put my name. Max Gross gave you a free ticket. Yeah, tell Tracy <laughs> Max said it was fine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know. Wish it worked that way. <laughs> so are there any other questions? If there aren't, we'll, we'll wrap up tonight. Um, but before we go, is there anybody who's here tonight who didn't come last week who would like to introduce themselves so that people know who they are in the future sessions? Hello, Paul. Hello. So we've got we've got two. So let's start with Ewade. Hello, I am Ewade from Nigeria, and um, I'm very happy to be here. Um, because of all the tips you gave me on street view photography. And um, today's lesson was very awesome. I learned a lot. The only thing I'm kind of having problems with is the um, mirrorless cameras and DSLR. I didn't get that part. And the um, okay. assignment you gave us on the um, expose and focus, I did not get that. Too. So I have been trying to listen to see if um, someone else will ask the same questions and my doubts will be cleared. Unfortunately, no one has done that. So I just sure. need to ask now. Sure. But I'm yeah. very happy to be here and to see your face. You look better than you look on Connect. Really, you should change <laughs> your profile picture, please. And you look so strict on Connect. Like, I never even knew you could laugh. It's yeah. so good to hear you. <laughs> So <laughs> here's the first part of your question. So you can see inside this camera, there's a mirror in there. I'm not sure if you can really see it, but there is in there. And if I shoot the camera, it'll move. So hopefully you're able to see that. I'm not sure if the webcam's quick enough. So the first thing that happens is that mirror moves. So the mirror is... Actually, I shouldn't move it. I was just going to move it to show you, but I won't. I might break it. Um, that mirror, the light's coming in through the lens, and that mirror is bouncing it up. 
So the mirror is on an angle like this. It's bouncing it up and there's a prism in this part of the camera in the top. And that's pushing it back out into this eyepiece in the back. So all that's happening is the lights coming in, going up and going out the back so that you can see it when you look through the eyepiece. Now the, the difference with a mirrorless camera, when I open this one, all you can see is the sensor. There's no mirror in there because the eyepiece that's on the back, the eyepiece that's here, it's actually a little computer screen, just like the one you're looking at at home. So if I turn that, actually it was turned on, so it may not have any battery left. No, it does have some, good. Um, you'll probably see, so you can actually see through the camera, but what you're looking at is the light that's been processed by the computer and displayed on that little tiny display that's in there. It's a tiny little screen. But there's also, conveniently, a much bigger screen on the back. So it depends how you want to use it. You can either use this screen, which has that same touch feature if you want to use it, or you can use the eyepiece. Um, I chop and change, depends what I want to use and which way I'm, I'm taking pictures at that time. Um, Ananda knows that I do a lot of street photography, for example, and in street photography, it's best to be not too obvious. So you might use the back screen on a bit of an angle or something like that. Now, the, what was the question with the task? Hello, Paul. Roger. Yes. yes uh, thank you. Uh, my question is: uh, uh, Sometime I go to museum, so glass uh, on some statue like that. So glass, how to avoid the glass reflection? Glass is horrible. Um, what <laughs> I, I'll, I'll bring a device to the next session, which I'll show you, which helps you with that. But if you've got, I notice you're wearing a black shirt in your profile photo. If you take a black T-shirt or a black piece of cloth, put your camera up against the glass and drape the black cloth over the top of it and try and hold it up against the glass underneath. You'll, that will help you cut down the reflections. Now, there are commercial things that you can use for that. There's a, a couple of different ones. There's a soft rubber one and okay. there's another one called a lens skirt. So if you want to Google lens skirt, mm -hmm. um, that's a, a device that you can put onto your lens that will help with that. It seals all the light out. Um, I've got a lens skirt, so I'll bring that to the next session and show you. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you. Cool. Any other questions? Hello, Paul. Renuka, hello. hello. Gee, hello. Uh, my question is, how can I shoot photo in cloudy season? Because uh, I found out there there is no clear photo. Are you thinking of uh, clouds in the sky or fog on the ground? Uh, both. Okay. Um, fog on the ground can be a little bit hard to get rid of, but if when you're editing your images later on, um, you can use your contrast in your image oh. editor, and that will help you to... It won't get rid of the fog. There's not really any way to do that. I know that um, there are editors, Lightroom has got the feature, I think Snapseed does too, where they try and get rid of fog, but it's not perfect, but you can sort of do it, but you probably do just as good a job with your contrast slider, generally. Oh, okay. Now, with cloudy skies, what are you having an issue with under clouds? Because the four... Uh... In the hill station, the I found the photo was not much clear. Uh, okay, so you're up high as well. I think so. Yeah. Um, if I remember the hill stations correctly, they're actually up on mountains, aren't they? Yes. Yeah. In mountain air, you can often get a lot of haze in the air, so it's similar to fog. Um, okay. That can, it does interfere with your image a little bit. If you're close to something, you should still be okay. Um, probably the main main thing to, to watch for yourself is when it's a bit foggy or there's haze in the air, um, try and make oh. sure that the sun's behind you. So okay. even, if, even if it's a cloudy day and you can't really see the sun that much, um, you'll still know where it is because there's still a bright patch. Try and keep that behind you. 
and that should minimise the amount of light you're seeing through the the fog and through the haze. Okay, okay, thank you. No worries. I'm just looking at Ogi Ogi talking. He's very animated. <laughs> um, are there any other questions? Hi, Paul. Yeah, hello. Rosie here. Uh, oh, just now you said Rosie for and... glass, na? Same way, when we click photo on a laminated things, laminated photos or certificate, there also a race passes and some shines come. So how to click photo when it is laminated? Thank you. Yeah. The other thing that can happen with shiny surface like laminate is you get an unintentional selfie. You might be able to see yourself. Um, those ones, it's actually difficult to do much about that. The best thing that I would suggest you do is move around to minimise the reflection of the light coming back from the shiny surface. Um, it's a little bit of a challenge to do that, especially if you're in a restaurant, but that's the best way to achieve it is to find somewhere where there's less reflections. So as you move around and you go from side to side, go up a little bit, down a little bit, um, you'll find that one of those angles or some of those angles will be better than others. Okay, thank you so much. Cool. Um, Shola? Oh, yeah, hello. Hi. Yeah, I, my, I'm actually Nigerian, but I live in Ghana. It's all in the West African coast. I'm very happy to be here. Cool. But my, I have a little question, if you can get me clearly. And the question is, the educational level in, in West Africa by the local guides are very is very low. Therefore, there are times you try to take a picture, but you have to be as discreet as possible, right? So it's a bit difficult to go by different rules. I, I really appreciate all the, 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 the workshop now if I can tell you about that. But like in the when you're trying to be as discreet as possible. And then as, uh, at the same time, get good click. Could you control, is there any remedy or advice or what could, what could you give us? Thank you. Yep. So Shola's question is um, about being discreet while he's taking his local guides images. Um, now I know in Nigeria and Ghana and, and some of the other African nations, people aren't as free to take photos as they are, for example, where I am in Australia, we can take a photo almost anywhere and no one's really gonna to say too much about it unless there's people in it and they might object sometimes. But um, in some other countries, you can't do that. So you might be challenged by the police, you might be challenged um, by a, a military person. And I know particularly in um, India and Sri Lanka, if you take pictures in a temple, people can get very upset with you. So if you're taking, the first thing I'd suggest is only take pictures where you're allowed to. Um, don't put your safety in jeopardy to get pictures for maps. The second thing I'd suggest is where you think it's okay, but you just don't want the confrontation. Um, if you're using a phone, that's probably the best way to do it because everybody expects people to be using a phone and taking pictures with a phone. Whereas if you're using a something like a, a big camera, like something this size, people will notice. Um, if you're using even a smaller camera, you probably get away with that. Whereas a big one, people are going to notice it and they're going to talk to you. Um, so it is a thing of discretion. Um, make sure you're not breaking any laws, though, when you're taking your pictures. And make sure you've got the right on your side. And if someone asks you to delete an image, I mean, I've been taking photographs for so long. If someone said that to me, I just say no and walk off. But I know that in my country that's okay because legally I can do that. It's fine. I can take the picture as long as I'm out in public. But in a lot of countries you can't. So I would suggest in those countries that you just delete it. And if you were using your phone, it's probably already uploaded to Google Photos anyway. So just delete it off your phone. They won't know. Not that I said that. I wasn't here. <laughs> Does that answer your question, Shola? Yeah, that's okay. Thank you. I got thank you very much. Cool. Sounds like Ravindu wants to say something. Good evening, Pat. Yeah. Uh, sorry. 
I'll, uh, I'll come back. I'll come back to you, Jose. Uh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Yes, well, a uh, little uh, clarification on like uh, taking photos and like this uh, temples and like religious paper, uh, places like you mentioned in some of the Asian countries. I think uh, it's not that uh, people don't like it, but sometimes uh, when like people, uh, some people when taking photographs, they use like a lot of flash and that uh, that could impact the, 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 the paintings in the temples. Some are like uh, with uh, very uh, high historical values so the, that times that sometimes uh, that's prohibited anyway and the and uh, so it, if you can like uh, refrain from uh, using the flash that will like uh, in, uh, that will uh, that will not affect the others who are worshiping or they they won't be distracted because of your photography then i think you should be fine yeah, definitely. I, I did actually get told off for taking a picture outside a temple in, in India in Chennai. <laughs> That's why I mentioned it. Um, in places like that, um, it also goes for things like museums and libraries and public buildings sometimes. It can be best to ask. And if you ask and you show some interest and you're respectful, even in places that often don't let you take photos, they will let you take one because you were respectful and you asked. So you probably will be okay. Um, I know in some religions, they definitely don't, don't allow it at all. But if you ask and the answer is no, that's okay. No one's going to mind. So, Jose, you had a question? Good evening, Paul. Uh, thank you for this wonderful session. Actually, I wasn't able to join last week. Uh, this week, I scheduled my time and... Uh, I was free uh, from uh, for the last one and a half hours, and it was a wonderful meetup, uh, and uh, with uh, some uh, fun jokes also by uh, one of our participants. Uh, <laughs> and, and thank you, thank you for conducting this wonderful session, Paul. Once again, thank you. Uh, no, no worries, you're welcome. And uh, you're welcome from Max. Hi, Paul. I think he's dropped off. Isha. Yeah. Hi, Paul. Uh, actually, I joined the last session uh, pretty late. I mean, I, it was almost awkward and I, because I, I didn't uh, I guess VP over there, so there was no reminder. So just let me introduce uh, to you all. Uh, I'm Isha and I'm, uh, I'm currently in London. So even I love photography and I try to put, I have put uh, my picture, some of the pictures taken by Beyond Connect. Uh, do, do see them. I'm not, I'm not that professional. You can call me a beginner. <laughs> But uh, I love learning about photography. So, yeah. So thanks a lot, Paul, for uh, conducting this, these sessions. Uh, that will surely help me, you know, upskill in this uh, lockdown phase. A new uh, skill that will, uh, you know, add into my profile. So I'm really happy. And thanks a lot for conducting this session. Thank you all. Yeah, no, you're welcome. Um, we had in the chat... I'm just trying to see who wrote it. Uh, we had Jason who said you can use a circular polarizer to reduce reflection. Yes, you can. That works on any kind of camera, including your phone, if you can get one for your phone. And we also had um, Rosie said that I don't take photos where it's written photography not allowed, and we should not. Yeah, I, in inside a building, I tend to agree with that. Um, in Australia, we actually have the right to take photos anywhere of anyone, as long as they expect that they can be seen or it's a, a building that's got a public face to it. So inside a building's a different story. Inside a building, you need to ask. But outside, you can take a picture anywhere you want. But that's not the same in every country. So make sure you know your local laws. If there's no more questions, we might wrap this up now, because we're coming up on a, an hour and a half. I have a question, please. Yeah, EYD, yes. Yeah. EYD. Yeah, I have a question. Um, if if I want to buy a camera now, like what kind of camera will you suggest that I should buy? Um, it really depends on what you want to do. So if you want to take pictures for Google Maps, unless you've got a specific thing and you want to do 360 photography, um, to be honest, I would actually suggest using a phone because that's the. It's going to give you good enough results for Google Maps, because putting a lot of people put these really high resolution photos up on maps from high end cameras. And there's actually no point because maps reduces the quality of the image anyway. 
So if you're loading an, an image from a phone quality, you'll probably be okay. Now, if you wanted to buy yourself a camera, um, it would depend on your budget and what kind of photos that you want to do. So, it, and it's a very personal thing, it's very subjective. So I could tell you to go and buy a mirrorless camera of a particular brand, but I won't because you probably need to shop around and see what's available for you. Now, what I would suggest is go to a, a camera shop, so don't necessarily buy it online but go to a camera shop and try them. So find one that you like the weight of it, you like how quickly it boots up, um, you like the kind of pictures that you can create with it. And usually the people in the shops will be really happy to help you learn about that camera as well. So I, I won't give you a specific recommendation, but go and try one and find one that, that works for you. So think about things like weight. Um, this is fairly heavy with this lens on it it's about one and a half kilos that's a lot to carry around all day if you bought yourself a big canon or a nikon the d3500 or something like that with a big lens on it similar sort of lens you're probably looking at five or six kilos and that's a huge amount of weight to carry or you could carry around that that weighs almost nothing <laughs> so it's a very personal thing what sort of camera you should get and there's no wrong answer All right, thank you. No worries. And if there's no other questions, we might wrap this up tonight. Yep. Cool. All right. Well, if, you, if you all want to unmute yourselves, just for amusement value, on uh, the count of three, we can all say local guides. Oh, Debbie, we've got a question. Uh, yes, uh, Debbie. This is my first time uh, in your meetup. Really like it <laughs> because I am a beginner level in uh, photography. <laughs> I just use mobile phone and 360. Cool. Nice to meet you all. My name is yeah, David nice from Jakarta, too. Indonesia. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, you started a really cool journey and you never really stop <laughs> learning in photography. I learn something every time I pick a camera up. <laughs> okay, okay. Cool. Oh, well, if you all want to unmute yourselves, just for amusement value, I'll count to three and then we can all say local guides together. Okay. <laughs> okay yeah, that's good. Thank okay. you. So it'll Thank be for this, uh, for this lovely awesome meetup. Session. It was a great session. You're all very welcome. Thank you very much. Yeah. So when I get to three, we'll all say local guides. So you ready? Jane, you have right. Yeah. yeah. Three, two, one. Two, one. Two, three. three. Local, local guides. guides. Local guides. Local guides. Yeah, local guides. Yeah, local guides. Thank you, Paul. Thank Proud you so much. Proud to local guides. Bye. Yeah. I think we just got the internet. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Hey, everybody. See you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 and good night, Paul. Good night, everybody. Good night. I mean, it's evening here. Good evening.